1 John chapter 2, and I will read verses 1 through 6. We'll focus in on verses 3 through 6 this morning. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this, we know that we have come to know him. And these are the verses we're going to focus in on this morning. By this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has been, has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. This is God's holy word. Let's ask him for help. Lord God Almighty, again we come before you this morning and we ask that you would be pleased to help us as we seek to hear your voice as you speak to us through the scriptures. You tell us in your word that all scripture all these holy writings are given by inspiration of God they're breathed out by you and they are profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for training and righteousness that the man of God may be complete thoroughly furnished for every good work and so Lord we bow our hearts before your holy word this morning knowing that it is you who speak and I pray that you would Give us understanding into what you say in your word and give us hearts that are willing to yield to what you say in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, even as we think about this important topic that we would not seek to conform our notions of what it looks like to be a Christian, to conform your word to our ideas, but instead conform our beliefs, our ideas, to what your word has to say. And so, Lord, help us. I pray also for those who don't know you. Lord, I pray that you would bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus this morning. For those who do know you, that they would grow and deepen in their obedience, in their love, in their walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. John MacArthur states that one of the most interesting people he ever met was a man by the name of Ferdinand de Mara. Ferdinand de Mara was born in the 1920s. He lived through the Great Depression, and he was known as the Great Imposter. He... It was said of him had a amazing IQ and a picture perfect memory and he would use these skills to be an imposter he would act like he was a surgeon he would act like he was a monk <laughs> he would even impose as an actor and was in a film a horror movie uh, he wore many different hats as he sought to be an imposter, a prison warden, an applied, a doctor of applied psychology, a professor, a lawyer, a child expert, a Benedictine monk, a Trappist monk, an editor, a cancer researcher, a teacher. On one occasion, there's a story of him being a doctor on a naval ship, a Canadian naval ship, and, uh, and all these wounded soldiers are coming onto the boat and he told them to stay in the operating room and he went into the room next door and opened up a book on surgery and began frantically reading what he was supposed to do amazingly nobody died in those surgeries he was the great imposter in fact they made a movie about him in the 1960s called the great imposter well, the Apostle John is dealing with some imposters in his letter that he writes in 1 John. 
He wrote in the midst of a context in which persons had arisen from within the church and evidently even had teaching positions, positions of leadership, but they were imposters. And they demonstrated that they weren't genuine Christians by departing from the faith and beginning to teach these heretical doctrines, these false teachings that were denying the real humanity of Christ, denying that Christ had come in the flesh. They also had an erroneous view of sin. They thought that because uh, matter is evil, the physical is spirit, the spiritual is good, that, that they don't actually ever sin in their spirit. And John deals with these claims in chapter 1 where he starts out the book saying, indeed, Jesus did come in the flesh, right? That which I saw, that which I heard, that which I, our hands have touched, he says in chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. We saw Jesus. We touched Jesus. And then later on uh, in chapter 1, John says that if you deny that you have sin, he says, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. He says that in verse 8. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so, really the first two tests that John lays forward to, to know if somebody is an imposter is, first of all, what do they say about Christ? What do they confess about who Jesus is? Secondly, what do they confess about sin? Do they confess themselves to be sinners? And then last time we saw that John says that he writes that we would not sin. But if we do sin, we have an advocate. Jesus Christ the righteous. Who is a propitiation for our sins. And so in the midst of the, these tests that John gives to, to determine whether one is an imposter and whether you yourself are an apost imposter, he says we need to look to Jesus as the one, the only one who can make us acceptable before God. The one who is our legal advocate before a holy God. Who is our high priest. And then this week we're going to see John is going to give another test. The test of obedience, really. The test of how do you know whether somebody genuinely knows the Lord. And, and as I mentioned with the young people this morning, that uh, Jesus, we need to understand Jesus is not only a priest, as a Savior, as we saw in 2, 1 and 2. He is a propitiation for our sins. He is the, our advocate. We, all, we also need to understand Him as Lord. That he is the boss whom we subject our lives to. And if we trust him as Savior, you are also trusting him as Lord. And this is important, especially uh, in a church context and especially in the mid-20th century. There was many ideas floating out there that you could trust Jesus as your Savior and then you're a Christian, you're forgiven of all your sins, and then sometime later you can embrace him as your Lord. And it was in the midst of that in the late 80s that John MacArthur published a book that became a bombshell on the playground of evangelical Christianity called The Gospel According to Jesus. In which he laid out that Jesus and his calls to follow him and his calls to salvation makes calls that he is the Lord. And if you are going to trust him, you must subject yourself to him as Lord. For instance, Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That Jesus is both Savior and Lord. He is the whole Christ. And those who trust in him... And the whole Christ as Savior and Lord, it will affect their lives. And so this morning we're going to look at three different body parts that are affected by trusting in the whole Christ. The first is your hands. Notice what he says in verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So John says plainly, by this we have come to know him. And he's going to say, if we keep his commandments. And so hands, the imagery of hands in the scripture is what you do. 
how you live, how you act. You, you think of the psalm who says that we must come before the Lord with what? Clean hands and a pure heart. And so what John is saying here is, by this we have come, uh, by this we know that we have come to know him. How do you know that you know the Lord? How do you know that you know him, he, is what he says here. And there, there's a little bit of a dispute whether him refers to Jesus or whether it refers to God. And really it's virtually impossible to settle the dispute, only to say that John says earlier, if you have fellowship with the Father, you have fellowship with what? His Son, Jesus Christ. So it could be either. How do you know that you know the Lord? How do you know that you know Jesus? This knowledge of the Lord is obviously speaking more than a superficial knowledge. According to the Bible, there is a sense in which everybody knows God. According to Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Through creation and conscience, everybody knows God. But obviously that's not a saving knowledge because people can know God in that sense and still go to hell. In fact, Paul writes, this knowledge of God makes them without excuse. And so when John says here, by this we know that we have come to know him, he's talking about a saving relationship with the Lord. How do you know that you have a saving knowledge of the Lord? In essence, John is probably saying, how do you know that you're a new covenant believer? Because one of the promises of the new covenant, according to Jeremiah 31, is that they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and, remember, and their sin I will remember no more. To claim to know God is to claim to be a new covenant believer, to claim to be in relationship with the Lord. And John is going to use this word no quite a bit throughout 1 John. In fact, he uses two different words for no, gnosko and oida, over 40 times throughout 1 John. And that becomes important because, remember, what was the name of the heretical group that John is addressing in 1 John. The Gnostics. The Gnostics. Okay? With a G. Okay? Their name was rooted in the term knowledge because these were people who claimed to have special knowledge of the Lord. They claimed salvation through this special elite knowledge of the Lord. And so they obviously would have regularly claimed, we know the Lord, we are the Gnostics, we have the special knowledge of the Lord. And it's in this context that John says, this is how you know that you know Him. And what does he say in verse 3 here? By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. If we keep his commandments. What commandments is he talking about? I think he's probably talking about those commands, those obligations that are binding upon New Testament Christians. You obey the Lord's commands. Remember Jesus when he commissioned his disciples? He said, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe, what does Jesus say? All that I have commanded you. Part of being a disciple, being a learner and a follower of Jesus, is learning to obey him, to obey his commandments. And notice the language here. He says, if we keep his commandments. The language of keeping his commandments is the idea uh, like a guard, a security officer guarding God's commandments, guarding Jesus' commandments here. Protecting them, watching over them so as not to violate them, so as not to cross the boundaries and to disobey them. 
And then notice what he says here. For the, uh, in verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's mean. That's mean. John's a meanie. But John speaks truth. And it's always loving to tell the truth. He says the one who says, I've come to know him. So I know him, the person says, and does not keep his commandments. John says he's lying. Lying about what? Lying with this profession that he knows the Lord. He's saying it's not true. He doesn't actually know the Lord. He may say he knows the Lord, but he doesn't. The one who says I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, let me clarify what John is not saying here. John is not teaching that our acceptance before God is based upon our obedience. Hopefully you're able to see that last week in 1 John 2, 1 and 2 when he says, I'm writing these things that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. That our acceptance before God is not based upon our obedience, but based upon the perfect advocacy of Jesus that's rooted in his perfect, propitious work, appeasing the wrath of the Father. That's what makes you accepted before God, not anything in you. Okay, so John is not teaching that our acceptance before God is based upon obedience. He's also not teaching that perfect obedience is necessary to be certain of knowing him. He's not talking about a perfect, infallible obedience here. And we know that because he said, what did he say about the person who says that he doesn't sin? Which the positive of that would be to say that I perfectly obey. In verse 8 of chapter 1, he says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, so he's not talking about perfect obedience because to, to even claim perfect obedience is to call God a liar. So while he is not talking about perfect obedience, he's not saying that keeping God's commands makes you acceptable before God, he is saying that keeping God's commands is evidence that you know him. Is evidence that indeed you are accepted before him on the basis of Christ's perfect work. Now some object to this and say, are you saying that in being certain of a person's salvation that they are to look at themselves? And they'll dismiss it out of hand. Well, well, you should look to Christ. Don't look at yourself. And I want to say it's not an either or. It's a both and. We, we have to acknowledge that based upon 1 John 2, 3 through 6. And really the rest of 1 John. I want to say look to God's work for you. In justifying you on the basis of the perfect work of Christ. But also look at God's work in you. Whether it's there or not. So look to God. Look at his work for you in the cross. As the only grounds for your acceptance before God. But also look in you to make sure that you have genuinely, genuinely been united to him by faith. Because if you look in you and it ain't there. John says... You're a liar. You're not a genuine Christian. You're an imposter. And this isn't anything new in the scriptures, is it? Doesn't James tell us? James 2.17, even so, faith, if it has no works, it's what? Dead. Being by itself. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. 
that genuine saving faith that unites you to Christ in his perfect work on your behalf will be a faith that produces obedience. It will change your hands. It will affect your hands. It will change the way you live. And John says if it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you claim, you're not a Christian. You don't know him. This is also what historically Christians have believed. Protestant reformers affirm this. It was Martin Luther who said, we're saved by faith alone, but that faith is never alone. We're saved by faith apart from the merit of works, but not apart from the presence of works. Listen to uh, the London Baptist Confession of 1689, which was plagiarizing the Westminster Confession of 1648. They said, quote, This infallible assurance doth not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long in conflict with many difficulties before he be a partaker of it, being enabled by the Spirit to know things which are freely given him by God, he may, without, without extraordinary revelation in the right use of ordinary means attain thereunto. And therefore it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure and thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness to God, in strength and cheerfulness, in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of this assurance. The duties of obedience as the proper fruits of of this assurance so far is it from inclining men to looseness so that historic Protestantism has always confessed that keeping God's commands obedience is an evidence of salvation it's an evidence that you have been justified before God declared righteous on the basis of Christ's work now it's also important to understand sometimes when we see passages like this and hard emphasis on obedience we, we can cringe and, and think well Matt I liked your message last week <laughs> but I don't know about the message this week okay this one don't make me feel good okay but you need to understand that keeping it, God's commands are rooted in his goodness God is not trying to be a meanie to keep you from something good. He's trying to protect you from poison. And this is where the scriptures would, would help us to understand that this kind of keeping the commands, this kind of obedience that is evidence of knowing him, it is not a legal kind of obedience, but it is a gospel kind of obedience. And, and what I mean by that, it's not a legal kind of obedience in that you're trying to, God, I, I just want to prove myself to you so that I'll be accepted before you. I want to prove myself to you so that you will take me as your own, as if... You're, you're a foster child trying to win the favor of a foster parent so that they would adopt you. No, not that kind of legal obedience, but it's evangelical obedience or gospel obedience. It says, I see verses 1 and 2, that you are my advocate, you are my propitiation for my sins, that you loved me and did that for me, and I'm forgiven of my sins, and I love you. And I want to do what you tell me to do. Because whenever you tell me to do this or do that or don't do that, you love me and you want what's good for me. And even though I may not understand it, I know that you always want what's good for me. So you seek to obey him. Not perfectly, but the pattern of your life will be keeping the commandments. And so, friend, ask yourself, do you, is the pattern of your life one of keeping God's commands? Is the pattern of your life one of obedience? If it's not, 
then John says, you don't know him. And I think he would tell us to go back to verses 1 and 2 and understand that embracing him and all that he did in verse 1 and 2 as the advocate who's the propitiation for sins he's also not only this advocate as priest he's also the Lord and so subject yourself to him in repentance go to him and if you look at your life and you think oh, I, I do see some obedience as I look over the past years I see some patterns but I also know that sometimes I have to look hard to see fruit confess it to him say Lord help me to grow in obedience every once in a while somebody will be sitting across from me and They've gotten their lives enmeshed in a mess of sin and they'll say, I don't know if I'm a Christian. You know what I say to them? I don't know either. But you're here and that's good. And you need to trust in Christ's saving perfect work and you need to repent. Christians are believing Christians and repenting Christians and you do that right now and you put your hand to the plow and you don't turn back and maybe it'll become more clear over the next weeks and months and maybe it will you have been being converted for the first time or maybe you lapsed into sin and and this was a season of disobedience I don't know but you turn to Christ the whole Christ as Savior, High Priest, and as Lord. So, trusting in the whole Christ is going to affect your hands. You're going to keep the commandments. It's also going to affect your heart. Secondly, verse 5, <clears throat> But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has, been truly, uh, has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The second body part here I call the heart. Love. Just on the heels of Valentine's Day we're familiar with hearts and love. He says, but whoever keeps his word, notice this phrase, in him the love of God has been perfected. Now there's an obvious question here. What does he mean by love of God? if we take it as what the of God phrase is what's called a genitive case okay so we're going back to seventh grade grammar here it's in the genitive and if we took it as a subjective genitive then it's God's love for us okay if we take it as an object of genitive then God is the object so it's our love for God I think for two reasons I think it's our love for God Number one, the context. He's talking about obedience, keeping the commands, and, and our love for God being perfected in the keeping of these commands. Secondly, if you look over, if you flip over to 1 John 5, 3, it says, for this, the love, for this is the love of God. Again, it's ambiguous. Is it love for God or God's love for us? Well, then I think it becomes clear in the next phrase that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So I think he's talking about here the love of God, this of God is what we would call an objective genitive. And if you're still not sure what an objective and subjective genitive is, you can ask Chuck later on and he'll give you grammatical insights on that, our in-house grammarian. <coughs> But point being here is that he says our love for God is perfected. Now what does he mean by perfected? Is our love for God is perfected as we obey him. Well, he, he doesn't mean that our love for God is perfect or without error, without spot, without blemish. What he means is perfected in the sense of completed. The end game of our love for God is when we obey him. In other words, 
obedience is a manifestation and a completion of our love for God. That, in other words, he's not talking about an obedience here is, you know, like, you know, when, when the, 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 the child who the parent tells them to sit on their hands and, you know, and they're just, on the inside, I'm not sitting on my hands, you know. You know. <laughs> it's not that kind of obedience that God, that, that kind of keeping the commands, it's the kind of keeping the commands where it's the manifestation and completion of love for God. So that John is telling us that this not only affects our outward action of keeping the commands, but this is the culmination of a transformed heart that loves God. That loves Him. And he says, by this we know that we are in Him. In Him. This is very Pauline language, like the Apostle Paul uh, who regularly speaks of being in him, in Christ. This is a manifestation. Our love for God is a manifestation that we are in him, that we know him, that we are in fellowship with him. And this is important because when we look at the nature of man according to the scriptures, man in his natural state, without being born again, without the Spirit of God, without the converting work of God in his heart, does not love God. He may love his own version of God, or she may love their own idol of God, but they don't love the true and living God. Romans 8, 7 says, The mind set on the flesh, that's the mind without the Spirit of God, is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And if you want the classic evidence that man by his nature doesn't love God, just think what happened when God came to this planet. Remember what John says? This is the judgment. John 3. Light has come into the world. And everybody got goo goo gaga over Jesus. No. Light has come into the world, but men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. They put him on a Roman tree and publicly executed him. Man does not by nature love God. And so John says, the one who knows him loves him. The one who genuinely has the work of the Spirit in the heart, there is a love for the Lord. And this is, Jesus says this over and over, right? John 14, 15, If you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and notice this beautiful language and will disclose myself to him similarly John 14 23 just a couple of verses later if anyone loves me he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him he who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear in the, the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So over and over, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But in this particular uh, section in John 14, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And my Father and I, we will love you. We will disclose ourselves to you. And this is a, a beautiful picture. Martin Lloyd-Jones has this wonderful illustration of this kind of of assurance that God gives as we grow in obedience and love for him. He says, imagine a child walking down the road with holding their father's hand. They have a, a, a sense that this is their father, their father cares for them. But then that father picks up that child and takes that child into their arms and smothers that child with their kisses. That's what Jesus means, says we will come to them and make our abode with them. I will disclose myself to them. To have that 
rock solid assurance I am loved by God I know that I am his and he is mine and this is this reality is truth with in many of our relationships the proof of a person's love is in their loyalty right the proof of their love is in their loyalty and if there's no loyalty then there's a lack of love I mean imagine a couple pondering getting married and the future groom saying to the future spouse that I am going to be faithful to you if we get married I'm going to be faithful to you 95% of the time going to go over like a lead balloon right no love will culminate in loyalty in a commitment the older writers used to distinguish between the love of complacency and the love of benevolence two big words when we think of complacency we normally think of lazy but they would speak of the love of complacency in the sense of the love that is satisfied in the Lord. Love of delight. It's filled with warm affections. And that kind of love is going to be true of, of God's people. But then they also talked about the love of benevolence that then seeks to do good for the object of that affection. And, and, and we get that as well in the context of marriage. is that delight in that person, the, the affection, but then you want to do good for them. Well, in a similar way with our relationship with the Lord, there's that love of complacence, but really the acid test of the genuineness of that love of complacence is the love of benevolence, whether they actually do any thing for that person whether they demonstrate their loyalty and commitment to that person and this is what Jesus you remember challenges Peter with remember Peter good old Peter who boasted that all those schmucks may abandon you Jesus but me we're tight you know I'm in it to the finish. And then the little girl around the fire says, Hey, aren't you a Galilean? No, no, I don't know Jesus. No, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know who you're talking about. Denies Jesus, remember, three times. And then there's that beautiful scene when Peter's gone back to fishing in John chapter 21. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, pursues his wandering sheep. And you remember Jesus, uh, uh, Peter and, and, and the boys are out fishing. They've gone back to the fishing business and, and Jesus is on the seashore, right? And he calls out to them from the seashore. And they recognize his voice. And he tells them to put out the net on the other side. They hadn't caught anything all night. You remember that was like deja vu right that had happened three years prior when Peter told or Jesus told Peter to put the net on the other side of the boat and he came in with literally a boatload of fish and Peter comes to Jesus falls at his feet apart from me I'm a sinful man I think it's in Luke chapter 5 so now it's a, the, the scene being rewound here after Jesus resurrection and he calls out, Peter, put it on the other side of the boat. And immediately Peter knows it's Jesus. And he puts on his outer garment, swims to the shore. And Jesus has breakfast for them, right? And you remember when he's talking with Peter, he asks him that question, right? Because he had been disobeying Jesus. And he said, Peter... Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? You remember Peter's response each time? Lord, I love you. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
But then Jesus said, feed my sheep. In other words, obey me. I didn't tell you to go back to fishing, Peter. I was making you into one of the leaders in my church. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Obey me. You see, friends, the acid test of our love is our obedience. But genuine love for the Lord is it evidence that you know Him. And so let me simply ask you this morning, do you love Him? Do you love Him? Do you see the wondrous God who is and love Him? Do you see all that He's done for you in Christ on the cross? Do you love Him? Do you see His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love flow mingling down? Do you see Him as the King who calls you to subject your life to Him? Do you love Him? And if you love Him, you're evidencing you know Him. You are one of His. But if you're like most of us, you also know your love for Him is not what it ought to be. And so you cry out, as Elizabeth Prentice has been teaching us all month, More love to Thee, O Christ! Hear Thou my prayer and plea, more love to Thee! You cry out, God, give me more love. Give me more devotion to you. Give me more affection to you. So when those moments of temptation that my love for you dwarfs my desire to sin. And you seek to grow in your love for the Lord. Well, trusting in the whole Christ going to affect your hands you're going to keep his commandments it's going to affect your heart the love of God is perfected it's going to affect your feet your feet the way you walk verse 6 the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked the one who says he abides in him. This is one of John's favorite terms, terms in relationship to Jesus. To abide in him. If you're familiar with John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine. You are my branches. Abide in me. Over and over. Abide in me. Abide. The idea to remain in him. To rest in him. To draw nourishment and dependence uh, from him. It's, it's the idea of, of being, again... A genuine believer. It's the idea of being in fellowship and partnership with the Lord. The one who says, I abide in him, notice this, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. To walk like Jesus walked. Now again, I can just hear the objection. Are you saying I have to live like Jesus? That if I'm not living like Jesus, I'm not a Christian? Yes and no. You're not going to perfectly live like Jesus. Nobody could do that. But there will be a following of his footsteps and various aspects of your life. There will be an imitation of him in how love him and adore him and admire him you want to more and more be like him and I see that in so many of you I see in some of you the way you serve others relentlessly and I think that looks just like the master I see the way some of you love the truth of God's word and despise air it's very much like Jesus. 
I see the way some of you demonstrate meekness and humility and I say, that looks like the master. You're walking in his steps. You're walking like he walked. And this is often the case when, again, you love and admire somebody and, and you've been with somebody. Every once in a while on a sunny day when I go downtown to the YMCA and park on the street there's a the PNC building has these windows that are mirror like windows I'll be carrying my bag and kids falling behind me usually and look up and have to do a double take because I think I see my dad in the reflection but then I look a little closer and it's not my dad. It's not somebody else walking like my dad. It's me. <laughs> I'm walking like my dad. And, and we get this. We, we often imbibe, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, we pick up the habits and mannerisms of those who are close to us. Those who we are with. Sometimes you see this in families, right? This, if you were to watch me and my brothers and sisters, you would say, I see some mannerisms there. Very similar. Well, in the same way, those who are close to Jesus will demonstrate some of the same patterns of life. Some of the same mannerisms. And, and when, we, when we read the Gospel of John over and over, one of the dominant mannerisms of Jesus is doing the will of the Father. He says on one occasion, John 4, it is, it is my food to do the will of the Father. Uh, John 6, 38, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. John 8, 29, he who sent me is with me. He has not let me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Over and over throughout the gospel of John, we see Jesus earnestly desiring to do the will of the Father. And then we see that classic passage in John chapter 13, where you can almost hear the disciples. I ain't washing nobody's feet. No, you wash their feet. I ain't, no. That's a job for lowly servants. A job reserved only for Gentile servants. I ain't your slave. I ain't washing your feet. And Jesus, with a towel around his waist, goes around with each person with a basin before him and he scrubs their dirty feet. And yes, indeed, it was a metaphor of a picture of what he would do in serving them the next morning on a bloody Roman cross. But you remember he also says at the end of it in John 13, 13, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. If then I, the Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. He did that as an object lesson, not only of what he would do in serving them the next day, but what they're to do in their lives. To humbly serve one another. That's how Jesus rolled. That was his strut. That was his gait. That's how we're supposed to walk. Yes, we won't do it perfectly if you're a true child of God, but there will be some following in his footsteps like it's a snowy day and you're trying to match the footsteps of another. There'll be some attempts at that. And if it's not there, then there's a good possibility that you don't know him, that you're not one of his. 
And if that's the case, if you're thinking about yourself and you don't see any evidence of God's work in you, then again you need to go to the whole Christ. He is the Savior, the one who is an advocate with the Father in our defense. He is a propitiation for our sins. Trust in His perfect saving work to make you acceptable before Him. Don't trust in any self-reformation or self-atonement. Trust in His perfect saving work. But also believe in the whole Christ. He is also King and Lord. And you say, Jesus, you're the boss now. I'm done playing the game. I subject my life to you. You are my Lord. And I will follow you wherever. I will obey you. And then you will know him. You will be believing in him as the whole Christ. Martin Lloyd-Jones sums up these verses in his exposition called Walking with God. He says, if you have the life, it is bound to show itself. And if it does not, then you have not the life. You cannot be receiving the life of Christ without becoming like Him. You cannot walk with God without keeping His commandments. You cannot know God without immediately and automatically loving Him. Love always manifests itself by doing what the object of its love desires. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank You for the truth of Your Word. In the midst of a day and age where... So much of, at least, American culture says, I know the Lord. And yet often lives a life that betrays that profession. I pray that you would help us to not hold on to a kind of shaky assurance that, oh, well, I prayed a prayer before, or I... I go to church or I do this, but Lord, help us to get honest with you, to have honest dealings with you. Lord, you see our lives. Lord, we can't fool you. Lord, help us to be honest with you and also, if in our honesty with you, we see that we're not the real thing, that we would lay hold of Christ afresh, perhaps for the first time. And Lord, for those who are struggling with assurance, I pray that they would lay hold of Christ also and subject their hearts and lives to Him and grow in their trust and love for Him. In Jesus' name, amen.